hello everyone, and welcome to the metagame! This series where we'll not only be talking about board games, but also we'll be talking about talking about board games. And I am your host, Chaz Marler, and in this episode, we're going to be discussing running a board game club. Now, I've been running one for several years now in my town. We have an average of attendance of between 9 to 19 people um, per, per the events that we do. I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned and some of the things that have I've discovered that have helped me. And um, a lot of these things, well, some of these things have been covered in a series, actually the first series that I did for Board Game Breakfast, and uh, that series about bo running a board game club. This is going to cover some of those in more detail, but also things that were either too long for that series and never got fit into it, but are also other little things that, that I've learned along the way. And maybe even some more philosophical things that will lend themselves to more of a discussion environment. Because that's what the metagame is all about, is this discussion, not only with me, but with the YouTube chat area. So... Along the way during the discussion, I'll be skimming the real-time YouTube chat for comments um, or suggestions or questions from people who are watching in real time. And if you want to have your comment considered for response being read on the show, add the hashtag TMG to your comment because I'm going to be using my search, uh, my web browser's search tool to search for that hashtag in the in the chat comments to highlight those that have that tag uh, so they'll stand out more and those will be the ones that I will try to address. Um, as always, don't know if I'll be able to address every single comment, but I do try to go through and reread the whole chat log after we're done with the show. So, all right, so. Let's talk about the amazing, fantastical subject of running a game group. And the very first thing, I, I came up with a list of about a half dozen points. Uh, hopefully helpful, incredibly useful things uh, to keep in mind when starting a game group. And the very first one that came to mind, number one, is what's your motivation for starting a game group or a game club in the first place? Because let, let's kind of establish what I mean by a game club. This is, by game club, I mean something that's a little more structured, a little more organized, a little more official than just having friends over at your house. Uh, this is if you want to actually create something in your community that is an event at a place where people that you don't know will be coming to to meet, um, become friends, and play board games together. And that, right there, kind of leads to the question of, well, what's your motivation for starting it? If your motivation for starting it, it can be many things. Uh, mine, for example, I started my game club a couple years ago uh, because, quite frankly, I was kind of miserable. Um, we had recently moved um, to out of town, so we're about 20 minutes farther away from town than we originally were. So a lot of the friends that I had growing up in high school and the friends that we'd made in town since we moved there over the last decade or so, uh, we weren't really close enough you know, that we, we saw each other often. And you know how it is. Oh, you're only 20, 30 minutes away. That's nothing. But in reality, you just don't see your fr your friends as often. So I really would, um, you know, I basically didn't have anyone to hang out with, really. So I was looking, I personally was looking to make new friends. So that was one of the reasons why I started it was to meet new people. And I think that that's a completely viable reason to, to start a board game club, you know, and you can also start it for the passion to evangelize the hobby and, you know, show modern board games are more than just monopoly to people. And that's a very altruistic um, reason to start a board game club. And that's a fine reason to start it. Uh, I just, what I always think about is if your reason for starting it is something like that that you can't really quantify uh, I want to spread the word it, it's probably going to lead to some, uh, an environment where you're not motivated to keep it going uh, so when you're when you're starting your game club try to have 
establish what your concrete motivation is for starting it. What is it that you want to achieve with your board game club? Because after one month, two months, six months, a year, after a while, you'll start to be able to quantify your results and see if you are achieving your goals that you set for why you started it in the first place. And if you are, it'll motivate you and propel you to work on it even further. Otherwise, there's a good chance that it'll fizzle unless you reevaluate your motivations for it. One motivation that I think actually is a poor motivation for starting a board game club is simply to play more board games. Because as the person, from my opinion, as I guess all this is my opinion or it wouldn't be me talking. So yes, that goes without saying. As the person who starts the board game club, you're going to be the host and we'll get more into this in a minute, but you're going to be the one responsible for running the show, especially at the beginning. And so you're going to go in there and you're going to have to be responsible for organizing it, making sure people uh, have places to sit games to play people aren't just standing on the sides feeling like outsiders coming in you're gonna have to be playing the part of the host and i've said this in several segments before when that when you're playing the part of a host you shouldn't go in with the expectations of even playing any games at all because if you because being the host and making other people feel welcome is going to be a higher priority when you're hosting than playing games. So if you go in saying, hey, I just want to play more games, an actual game club probably isn't the best approach. Just, you know, getting together with friends and, and stuff is, is probably the best way. But so, it, but if you really want to take the approach of having this thing that stands on its own in the community as your town's board game club, don't expect, don't have your motivation be to just play more games because it doesn't happen. I can tell you this, I am not the only one who, who hosts board gaming events in my town. There's about three consistent regular ones that I know of and attend. And when I attend board gaming events that are hosted by other people, it's like, it's this weird side effect I didn't realize would happen, but I am so much more relaxed when I go to their events now than I would have ever been because I realize I don't have to run anything. I can just sit down and play games and enjoy it. So having that balance, if you're hosting, maybe find other ones as well, which again, I'll get to, I'm going to follow up on this as well, but having a variety of hosts can actually be really beneficial uh, to hosting. So Okay, um, I'm tempted to go over to the comments here and I'm looking at the comments real quick and uh, this early in the show, none of the comments are on the topic that we're talking about, which is fine, but I like to save those for the end. So feel free to post your off topic comments with the hashtag, but um, I'm going to continue on with the topic and then we'll come back to comments about the topic and all comment comments on the end. So let's continue on. So. That's your motivation. So once you decide that you want to make a board game club and for whatever reason is your motivation, second part is to figure out where it's going to be hosted at. And I did not number my little bullet points here. And so I'm just going to real quick because that wasn't number seven. That was number two. Where's it going to be hosted at? So after you find out you're going to be doing this, you want to figure out where to host it. And again, if we're talking more about something that's more than just having people over at your house, actually meeting new people, strangers, and creating kind of a local board game community, I expect that you're probably not going to want to have it at your house. Um, so you're going to have to find a different venue. Now there's there's lots of different venues and a lot of people have talked about this, so I'm not going to dwell on this a lot, but just a quick checklist. Uh, you know, um, there's uh, schools and after school programs. There are um, 
you know, uh, churches are a good place. If you're involved in a church, it's a really good place to have um, a board game group uh, meetings at local game shops. Of course, lots of game stores have dedicated space for gaming and that can be a good way to, um, you know, educate more people about the game stores that are in your area and support those as well. So, you know, um, results may vary there depending on the amount of space and how busy they are and how open they are to that idea, but obviously game shops. Um, but the, I think the, 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 the diamond in the rough that I discovered about having a game club that, uh, I don't see come up as often is community centers and most cities and towns have some sort of public community center space. Uh, your mileage will vary. Some are very nice and modern. Some were built in the seventies and were last cleaned in the eighties. Um, so you're, you know, it's gonna, gonna vary. And the other thing about this is that about using a community center, it's a great public place in the middle of town. So it's kind of centralized for everybody, but some cities will charge. Uh, you have to go to town hall or something and they'll charge for the use of their community center. But I've discovered, um, since I first started the series and first talked about community centers, I've discovered a few things. I've discovered that, um, some community centers, some city halls, some city governments are open to the idea of things that are public for the public good, like a board game group where we want to build a community and have a safe, fun place for people to come and, and you know do this activity. Some city governments will say, oh, well, you can use the community center for free or you know, we'll sponsor it or something. So it's possible actually to even get sponsorships for your game group where uh, they will, that will, which will either offset the cost of renting the space or will allow you to use it uh, at no charge. Um, our game club is sponsored by our local library. And um, so the library actually um, makes sure that we have the space and helps us reserve it and provides us with access to it. Um, and we're considered kind of a, a library event, even though it's taking place at our town's community center and it's worked out really well. And the people there are really nice. So with a little bit of research and a little bit of legwork, you can sometimes find a nice space that can uh, sometimes have stipulations where they will provide you the space at no cost. So finding out where it's host being going to be hosted at is worth, I think, doing some research and not just taking the first place that pops up on your list. You know, like you, the intersection at Oak and 10th might be open and very low traffic on weekends, but if it's the first place you find, keep looking. You might actually find uh, more, more places available. Okay. So. You've decided you're going to make your game club the number two. You've found your location of where it's going to be hosted at. The third thing that you need is other gamers, other people to show up. And uh, I've spoken about this in a previous segment as well. So again, I'm not going to go into super amount of detail about it. But um, and actually, I think what I'll do is in the uh, description of this video, once this goes live, once this is no longer live and goes up as a, a video on the Dice Towers channel, I'll edit the description of the video to add a link to the playlist of all of the videos in the series of building a game group that I, I've done for the Dice Towers Board Game Breakfast Show. But for now, how are you going to find these members? Well, there's just, again, real quick, several things that I didn't think of at first, but um, word of mouth, obviously, and flyers. Um, I've discovered that local game stores are open to the idea of uh, advertising your board game club, even if you're not hosting it there at the store, because again, it grows the board game community. Uh, if more board gamers uh, enter into the community, it's going to mean more people that know about it and uh, lead to, you know, more potential customers for the store. So, uh, putting up flyers and such at board game, um, in board game stores. Um, also, if someone knows of um, 
if, if someone knows of a local paper or something that they have um, in your town, um, lots of times those will have a free local events bulletin area in the local paper. And actually, when I was starting out, I even did that and went to local businesses like um, our local grocery store had a public bullet bulletin board. And I put flyers and such up on like the grocery store's bulletin board. And the local papers and a couple of websites of local community events. And if, if you look a little bit, you'll find all these little places to that, that, you know, that um, you wouldn't, wouldn't have thought of at first that you can advertise your board game club. And lots of those outlets aren't the most, uh, the highest return on investment. I think maybe f three to 4% of the people in our board game club came from like flyers and, and um, community bulletins stuff that wasn't posted in a board game store and other, you know, just weird places. But um, the majority of the people who have discovered our board game club actually came through the website meetup.com M E E T U P.com uh, meetup.com is a website developed specifically for posting events and group meetings and clubs and stuff like that. The only drawback to meetup.com is that it's not free. Um, now, lots of what you have to do is if you are going to create a club, you have to pay, so it could be f around $50 every six months or something like that. It, it can be pretty spendy. So um, if you're going to take that route, you'll, you'll, in my experience, you'll get the most people discovering your board game club, but it also is a paid service. I'd say easily upwards of 85% or so of the people in our board game club uh, discovered it through the meetup.com website. Also, if uh, what's really weird is there are at least three different meetup groups. Um, there's three different separate distinct meetup groups uh, running meetup pages in our town of 120,000 or so. So now if we were smarter, we would get to know each other better and all consolidate into one meetup group so we could split the cost and post all of our events in that one group's profile. But each of these groups has paid for their own individual profile and is posting their meetup groups under it. So. Again, if you're looking for other gamers, if you're doing that much, you might as well get to know some of the people that are running the other uh, clubs and stuff, and maybe you can consolidate to, to save on expenses. Another place, and I just saw it mentioned in the comments on the side of my vision here, and I'm going to mention that too. Another common place that people meet up at uh, is at restaurants. Uh, and to be honest, that's always kind of puzzled me. I've gone to very few uh, gaming group meetings at restaurants uh, because you, of course, you have a table, but you have everything else that's going on and the crowd. And I always worry about loitering, you know, how long can we sit here and is the restaurant going to want to kick us out? But that is another very common place to meet at, which um, I don't know why I just jumped back to number two because we're talking about number three about finding members. But people do get hungry. So if you are meeting at a restaurant there's a really good likely chance that you might find new members simply by hungry people walking into the restaurant and after they order, looking over at your table going, what you guys doing? Poof, instant member. Okay, so that's number three, where to find members. That's kind of a, a nice list there. So you, got, you made your club, you know where it is, you know who's there, you're all set, right? Well, that's the first half of the idea, the first half of the conversation. Let's talk about some things that haven't talked about in previous segments. Let's talk about keeping this thing running because number four on the list, now that they're numbered, I can see that number four is consistency. And to be honest, this is something that I've struggled with myself with my own game club. It doesn't matter if you meet every week, every day, two weeks, once a month, uh, quarterly, annually, it doesn't matter how often you meet as long as you can make it consistent so that the people who are interested in attending your game club know 
when it's going to be, and they can plan on it. If your schedule is inconsistent, it will hurt your attendance and all the work that you've done will kind of unravel a little bit. I try to have um, the game club that I run, I try to have it be every other week. Um, and if not every other week, at least every every three weeks. And for the first year and a half, it ran like clockwork. Uh, but then over the last six months or so, there were some um, issues with the space we wanted to use and some other things. But it led to us kind of our schedules getting mixed up a little bit and it hasn't been as consistent. And I've seen the lack of consistency in our scheduling result in there being a few people who were regulars stop showing up as regularly, which is sad. Um, so again, it doesn't matter what the schedule is as long as it's consistent because one of the, the, I've mentioned that, uh, we have people who come to the events. We have between nine to 19 people show up regularly. There's another event in town, another group, uh, the Eugene, Eugene games gala or EGG or egg. And they do a once a year, um, three day convention. And they do quarterly game days. So they only do five events a year. But they're, they are consistently 30 to 60 people show up at their events. And they barely uh, advertise. And they only do five events, but they do them consistently. We always know when the, 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 the three-day convention is always on or right around Super Bowl weekend. And then the quarterly game days are just spaced out throughout the year from there. So you kind of know, and it helps a lot. Um, and it, the results and the number of people who attend um, are a testament to that. So don't try to kill yourself by making it every single day or every third day or something that's gonna be too much of a burden. Don't worry about, about the frequency. What's more important than frequency is consistency in your scheduling. All right, that's number four. So now you're gonna, you know how often you're gonna be having your game club running. The next thing that's gonna happen is human nature. It, I don't, I, I taught, uh, I taught a cartooning class at my local community college a decade ago or, or so. And it was just a, a class people took for fun. So it wasn't like a college credit course or something, but it was kind of a continuing education course. But I saw the strangest thing, uh, class after class after class. People would sign up for the class, be really excited about taking this neat, you know, cartooning class and just, oh, this is great. This is gonna be so much fun. I'm, I'm so excited about this. And no matter how excited the people were about the class, as soon as there was the first session of class and people sat down in the seats, human nature took over and everyone thought we're we going to get out early uh, <laughs> because human nature is just that no matter how much you enjoy something and how much you're looking forward to an event, more than likely you, I don't know if it's cold feet or just the way the mind works, but people always seem to want to be somewhere else. So number five, is find someone who can help you share the burden of hosting your events. Once you get it up and running, find someone who knows how you want to be running these things. Because not only as an attendant, a person attending it, as the host, someone who put so much work into this and really enjoys this and loves seeing it grow and, and loves making this for the community and, and playing games and make the new friends that you've met. Even then there's times where it's like, oh, I gotta go do that. I gotta go do that game club today. I gotta be there and I gotta go open the doors and I gotta go let everyone in. We gotta clean up afterwards and then we gotta lock up. We gotta put all the stuff away. Oh man, is it even worth it? So finding someone who could help share this, someone that you can alternate the, the burden of hosting. And sometimes, so maybe you can alternate where they're in charge so you can play games and then the next time you're in charge so they can play games and go back or they can go get the keys to open up the center or they can vacuum afterwards after you're all done. 
Finding someone who can help share the burden will help keep your game club running. And that's something that I've never heard someone else talk about before. And I never thought about until about a year into my own game club when things were going really well. One of the best friends that I've made through that game club just one day as we were setting up uh, came up to me and he said, hey, um, do you. Is there anything I could do to help? You know, if you if you're ever out of town, do you want me to you know open things up and I can help and I can do it? And it blew my mind that someone else out there that enjoyed board games as much as I do, and the events that we were hosting as much as I did, wanted to be involved. It's silly, but sometimes you get into this little feedback loop, this little bubble. And you don't realize that there's other people out there that are willing and able to, to help out. So find those people. Find at least one person who can help. Because not having to do everything yourself all the time will help keep your game club going and growing. Um, so that you don't, it doesn't just become a big albatross around your neck and a big burden. So important Important tip there that I have learned from personal experience in running a game club. And that's number five on our list out of seven. So now you find it your helper. And he, whether it's just someone who goes to the club that you trust or it's one of your best friends that you've had for, for decades and decades, you're going to run into a problem. Yes. See, having a helper is useful and will keep the game club growing but it introduces a problem the problem is that whether you're running a game club or a company or anything like that the person who starts it will run it their way they'll come up with the rules of the game and set the expectations for everyone else involved and that's great but then what happens is that if someone else starts running things, they have their own set of rules of the game and they will run things their way, which is not necessarily bad, but the things that they run differently will change or possibly conflict with the expectations that have been set with everybody. It's substitute teacher syndrome. You have your fourth grade class, and all the students in it are happy. But then there's a substitute teacher that comes in. And the first things the students say is, our regular teacher doesn't do things this way. This is broken. We're on strike. Okay, maybe not that far. But the, the, the point is that the substitute comes in, does things differently, and confuses everybody involved. And that's a bad thing. So how do you prevent that from happening because having someone help you share the burden of hosting I think is critical if you're going to continue running this uh, after a while after the the shine comes off the apple after the honeymoon phase and you, you want to keep it going you're going to need help so how do you prevent that confusion that substitutes teacher syndrome from happening well the way you do that is by actually establishing a written list of policies for your game club rules and etiquette and it might sound draconian or a little too businessy but having a document <clears throat> that lists the policies for the game club that you can refer to and everyone can refer to will keep it running smoother and better because you'll have a consistent cornerstone that everyone can refer to when questions arise now this can be something this can be as elaborate or freeform as you want really it depends what you want the environment for your game club to be what do you want the vibe of your club to be you know you're you're it could be something as fine-grained as you know this is the number of chairs that we will set up and the number of tables that we will have set up and you know this is where we will put our games in the room and this is you know, when we will open the door and this is you know you can have it be that finely detailed you don't have to but you can but having this document that sets up policies um, will help things keep running smoothly because everyone will know when things happen 
But even more importantly than that is that this documentation should have information in it that deals with potential conflicts and problems that need to be resolved. Because the worst thing for a game club or, or in any organization, the worst thing that can happen is that when you have some sort of disagreement between people, some sort of conflict, and the person who's currently in charge at that moment in time has to make a call using their gut that might not be the same decision that the other person running it may have made, that's when you're going to run into really big problems that will kill your game club. So what if someone's caught cheating? What if someone's being a jerk? What about handling spills? What if you have you know f snacks and drinks and someone spills stuff all over a game or on the floor, which gets you in trouble with whatever place the runs the controls the venue? What about uh, uh, what about your policy on minors and bringing children to the game clubs? Uh, some game clubs that I attend have a family friendly policy. And some are 18 and older and for various different reasons. But if you, uh, you know, so you need to decide who is your audience and how are you going to handle the, the variety of, of you know, audience? Are, are kids going to be running around free form or do kids have to stay at the table with their parent and always be playing the game with their parent? Are you going to set up a separate kids table just for the kids where they're at? Uh, how, you know, what's that going to be? Because that can be a source of friction. We had something I hadn't even thought of at first was, um, you know, the, the, our city lets us have snacks in our community center, but we have kind of a separate snack table. We actually have a separate kitchen area. And at first I thought it's going to be a no brainer. People, when they have snacks and stuff, they're going to go eat in a little kitchen area, but that lasted for about one second. And people just would bring their snacks over to the table at the games. So we started saying, okay, well, let's not bring like salsa and stuff like that, which again lasted for about two minutes. Um, and so there's been some times every now and then I've had to update um, and verbalize to everyone and kind of update in anything written we have saying, okay, these type of snacks are discouraged. Don't, don't bring powdery donuts don't bring salsa please let's bring stuff that's dry and let's try to keep things over in the snack area and if you bring your snack over have a bowl and and make sure the person who owns the game is comfortable with people eating their snacks around it that was good but then after a while another thing that i didn't even think of when we started the game club that became an issue was people with drinks open containers i thought you're always i thought it was a no-brainer that everyone was going to have a screw top lid for any drink that they brought, but no. Um, so we had to establish a policy, written policy saying, anybody who drink, if you're bringing a drink, it must have a sealable screw on cap lid or something. It must be sealable. And it was something that we discovered we had to communicate. Um, now we've never had anyone like caught cheating. We've had a couple of people that weren't too thrilled with other people in the game clubs um, sometimes, but that's always, um, we've been able to work that out. Uh, and partially because we do have a policy uh, that's written out. We've, we've never had the point with personal con uh, with interpersonal conflict. We've never had a point where we have had to actually pull them aside and refer, pull up the written policy and refer to it. We've never had it go that far, but knowing that that tool is available for whoever is running it to point to and have a consistent response to it is critical to the long-term health and lifespan of a game club. So establish policies, rules of etiquette, uh, and have that available for everyone. So no matter who's running it, they all manage the game club the same way. That's number six. Number seven, the last item on our list is the maybe most important part actually of running the game club. The thing that pulls it all together is making people feel welcome. And this ties, this ties a string through everything. Uh, you know, what's your motivation 
if you're just going to play games, you're going to be ignoring people that walk in and they're not going to feel welcome. And again, this is another one I've, I've spoken about on board game breakfast segments, but something to keep in mind is uh, again, I've seen it and I've experienced it my, myself is especially when your game club starts running, you know, our, ours has been going over two years now. And there's a group there. There's people in here who have become really good friends who like to play together. And that's, that's fine. But as the host, and some of these friends are my friends, and I want to play with them. But as the host of the event, there's nothing that makes me feel worse than when someone arrives late. Someone new arrives late. So everyone is already in games, set up and running games, and having a good time. Someone new walks in, and now they're already an outsider coming into this clique. And they can feel like they're invading other people's good time. So being cognizant of that and knowing and having the people that you're playing with know, hey, I'm the host. When this happens, I'm going to have to excuse myself from this game. I am going to have to abandon this game to go, at least even temporarily, but I'm going to have to step out to go be a host to this new person and make sure that they aren't feeling like an invader coming in. And that, from my own personal experience, um, can be very rewarding, but also really, really difficult. Um, I mean, sometimes um, it can be really intimidating to go up and talk to someone that you've never seen before and introduce them to this thing that you're really familiar with. Uh, and um, But it's something that with practice does get easier. But... I think that uh, making people feel welcome is really important. And it's not just new people walking in late. It's also just the social atmosphere that you want your game club to have. And this, of course, ties into something that people have been talking about this week and before this week as well. But um, making your game club welcoming to everyone, whether they're men or women or a different ages or backgrounds or ethnicity or anything like that, fostering this environment that's welcoming to everyone because board gaming is one of these activities that in my experience has is enjoyable by everyone from every walk of life. And that's one of the things that's so cool about it is that you can have these two people that never would have met, never would, don't even share any other interests, but they can come together around this game and enjoy the experience together and creating an environment that fosters that and welcomes that is, is, is critical to it. And that's one of the things where if there is, if there are things that are stopping that welcoming environment from happening, Having, number seven, your established policies, your rules of etiquette, and how your game club is run, having that to fall back on to correct the people that are not creating the social environment that you want to create, that's one of the things, uh, that's why number six, the policies can be so critical because they can help you foster your welcoming environment. Now, so in summary, that, so that's seven things about running a game club. And, and we're going to go over to the comments uh, real quick. But um, in, in total, that's the, the goal of this um, is you know, to create a place where you know, whatever your motivation for starting your game club can come to fruition. And it's something that takes a lot of work, but can be very, very rewarding. Um, I uh, personally... When I, I mentioned at the beginning, my goal for starting my game club was to make new friends. I was basically, I felt like I was starting from zero. Uh, new city, uh, you know, my friends that I knew for years weren't coming over, so I wanted to make new friends. And that respect, I have achieved those goals with my game club. There's um, at least, I say there's easily 10 people now that I've met over the last two years who I would feel comfortable hanging out with even outside of our game club at, at just anywhere. And a couple of, a few of the people have actually become really close friends that um, I s keep in touch with and see even when, you know, just day to day. So that 
has been extremely rewarding. And those results alone are something that make me feel it's absolutely worth the work and the effort to start a game club because if you can achieve your goals, it is so rewarding and not just because you get to play more games. All right, let's turn this over to the comment area and start to search here. All right, I see, ooh, wow, wow, there's about 36 comments here. So I'm going to start skimming the comments to, um, to see what we can find here. I'm going to start, with this. the first cluster wasn't about the topic yet, so hopefully I can come back to those. Uh, here we go. Motivation. Okay. Ta-da! Sorry. Okay. Sasha mentions, uh, playing more board games, quote unquote, playing more board games isn't really a poor motivation. Only if you believe the club runs itself and you get all the fun without any work. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's true. I mean, why would you start a game club if your one of your goals wasn't to play more games? I mean, it's, Yeah. That's, of course, that's part of it. And I, I hope that the additional bullet points that we made illustrate kind of how to pull that off, you know, getting more people to help and stuff like that. But yeah, if it's your core solo motivation, then you might run into some troubles. Um, but yeah, I, I believe playing more games is not a bad one in and of itself if it goes along with other motivations. Kabuki Kid mentions... The guy who's technically the head of our meetup does always make a point of playing Ticket to Ride with new people when they show up for the first time. Oh, excellent point. It's one of the things I wanted to mention is that when I go to my game club, I take at least a dozen games. Uh, in ours, everyone brings their games. Uh, another one in town actually has kind of a communal library that's owned by the facility, which is kind of cool. But for the one I manage, we all bring our own games. And right along with not planning not on playing games myself, I do always bring, uh, I always kind of, I cycle through Ticket to Ride, uh, Forbidden Island, and Las Vegas, and one or two others that I always cycle. Kind of the, the games I think are the core, excellent introductory gateway games for new people. Uh, because lots of times what I'll hear when someone hears about the game club and they'll say, what's this club? Oh, about modern board games. Oh, you mean like Monopoly? It's like, well, and then you branch off from there. Monopoly is nice and has, you know, was nice at its time, but there's so many new concepts and things that have come out in gaming and they've become more sophisticated. Why don't you come and see what there is now? They're like, oh, that sounds intriguing. And then when they show up, having kind of this, knowing that you brought this core set of really good introductory gateway games to kind of not overwhelm them, but are still fun. It's really important. So the guy who brought ticket to ride, who brings ticket to ride all the time, makes a point to play that with new people. I think that is excellent approach. Personally, my game of choice for that is, is forbidden Island, but, um, that's an excellent point. Okay. Uh, Scott mentions as host, you can probably go in expecting to play some games True. But nothing long slash heavy. I host a monthly game night at my church, going in expecting to play maybe some diamonds or ink and gold. Uh, yep, exactly, Scott. Um, I, uh, I've had that same experience. I think I, I was lucky enough. I think I played an hour. I think I did play a two-hour game last time. Uh, but again, it's always playing it with one eye, watching the door, seeing if, seeing if everyone comes in. What's nice too is our our group. We we kind of the core group knows each other well enough now that they they know that um, you know I'm on host duty. So they're like, yeah, go. We'll we, we'll even wait, or we'll do you know, we'll do something else. They, they, they're as you get to know everybody, uh, everyone everyone kind of helps each other too, which is really nice. Iman mentions. I'm going to start one in my small town, primarily for strangers. I am concerned about location liability. I don't have money to replace a broken window or table if someone breaks it. That's a very good point. And uh, that's something that I, I worry about. Uh, to be honest, uh, when we go, I always take paper towels and a little mini vacuum. Um, and we always uh, clean up. And we've actually, like I said, we've nixed certain snacks that are spill proof that create spills. We say, Hey, you can't have, you can't have salsa or powdered donuts or stuff like that. Um, 
but we always make a point to clean up and like we vacuum the place after we're done, even though the city probably does it too. But um, just because we want to make a good impression with the people that own the facility. When you start, if you are uh, the community center that I did, and I think most of them are this way, they actually had a city contract that you, not necessarily a contract that locked you into anything, but an agreement that you signed. And it stipulated who was responsible for what and what would happen. So if you are concerned about liability for broken windows or things like that, ask if they have a written policy, an agreement, because the place that owns the facility, if they are concerned about those things, which they should be, they should have the written rules of the game of using their space. If they don't, actually watch out. Because if there is no written policy, just like for your game club, if there's no written policy for the space and a window does break, they're going to say, well, you should fix this window. Well, we don't have the money to fix a window. Well, it's just common decency you should. If there's a written policy, you know exactly who's going to do it. If the insurance is, if the venue's insurance is going to cover it or if they expect you to do it, you know what to expect. So if, if, you're, using a, if you're using a different space, get their written agreement that outlines the liabilities involved. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Ni uh, Nyris, uh, Nyris Interactive mentions, would it be smart to have designated greeters that are equipped with two-player games so new newcomers have something to do until the larger games open up? Um, I think that's definitely something that's worth experimenting with. The problem I've run into is that if you do have dedicated greeters with new player ga two player games for newcomers, if you don't have any newcomers show up, now you have the greeters having nothing to do. So you replace one person having nothing to do with another person. Um, it's just something to experiment with. Uh, I don't think there's any really right answer. I think that really you have to take the temperature of the group and find out what works for the people involved. Um, so experiment with that. I think it's definitely worth trying. Um, okay, Kabuki mentions, I always make a point of keeping a two-player game or two in my bags just in case there are two people out left waiting for other games to end. Yes, having everybody, if you are running a game group where everyone that comes contributes games to that day's gaming, make sure that everyone brings a variety of different games. That's one thing that's great about my group. Um, one of the people that comes to my group um, it has a game collection that dwarfs my own. <laughs> and... And he's really, really cognizant of making sure that he brings a variety, not only stuff that he wants to play, but he does bring a variety of different number of player games and different experience level games as well. So we kind of work together and um, it's really, really helpful. All right. Uh, let's see here. Faramir the Ranger states... My game group started out as a fencing club. Well, that's interesting. The gamers among us started meeting up for games, and it grew to a steady group of about 14 people now. Well, that's cool. That's another benefit of like the meetup website, is there are meetups for all sorts of things, not just gaming. So if you're completely out of ideas or not having any luck, sometimes getting involved in other things that you have an interest in, you will meet other people that also have an overlapping interest in gaming, whether it's fencing or anything, um, and it could lead to finding people for a game club. So that's a good that's a good approach. Plus you get to learn how to do fencing, which, hey, that's, you can't argue with that. All right, uh, Jarb mentions, what about joining forces with a restaurant to make yourself known? Um, actually, when I mentioned that a comment about restaurants caught the corner of my vision, Jarb, it was your comment right there. Um, yeah, like I said, co uh, restaurants seem to be one of the most common meeting places. I'd say 75% maybe of the meetups um, that I see on the meetup websites for our town take place at restaurants. So the restaurants have got to be open to it. Again, talk to the person who runs the restaurant to find out what their expectations are. Do they expect a people to have a big catered dinner or do they not care? Do they have the space? Are there certain days that they prefer when they're slow that they would want people in certain days are really busy. They wouldn't want a bunch of gamers in. Uh, they may have some suggestions. So, uh, I think restaurants are a viable one. They're not my personal favorite, but they're a viable option. So definitely talk to the people about it because it can be a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, okay. 
that's interesting. Don Mage states, I meet up in a college association. I arranged it in such a way that the association is open for everyone one day every other month. There you go. Uh, I live in a college town as well, um, but during college, I wasn't, that was one of the lulls where I wasn't into modern board gaming like uh, as I am now. So I never took advantage of some of the resources that are available on the college campus. But yes, there's an excellent area, college campuses. Um, that can be a great, great place because that's also f often filled with people from out of town that don't know anybody and are looking for stuff to do and to meet friends. So college campuses, a really good one. And they sometimes even have facilities available as well. Uh, Kabuki mentions food courts at malls and places like supermarkets work too. There are several in the meetup groups near me. The complaints might be noise or tiny tables that you have to move together. Um, you know, there's even um, at least one supermarket, and I don't know why, but there's one supermarket here in town that actually has an upstairs that has a rentable meeting room. And I don't know who discovered this or why it's there, but... Sometimes businesses, supermarkets, or other things like that will have actually meeting areas that if you know who to talk to and you can discover them, they're available um, for to use as well. So that can be another very um, good space that no one knows about. Um, see. Uh, then there's a statement, my group usually has three or four people who reliably bring a bag or two of games for everyone to pick from. There's usually a good variety, even if not everyone brings games. Yep. If everyone that's involved that has games can bring a few, even if they're games that they don't personally want to play that day, but might be good games for others to cover a variety of bases, it's an excellent approach. Um, Romyo, um, apologize if I pronounced that wrong, mentions um, is it really that rare for gamers to game at home? Um, no, I don't think it's that rare at all. And um, in case it was missed, in case you came in late, um, the approach I was taking in this discussion was um, specifically not gaming in your home. I was talking about creating a kind of public game group to meet new people that specifically started out with strangers, so you probably don't want to invite people over to your home necessarily. So how do you start building that type of game club environment? So that that's that's why we were focusing on everything outside the home. Um, Pagan Eagle 2001. Much better than Pagan Eagle 2000. I'm, I'm really happy to see your upgrade. Uh, mentions, sometimes people have limited time and other things they need to get back for. That's why sometimes people want to go early. Uh, yes, that's one thing. When I've been running my game group, um, it's silly. But if someone leaves early, there's always that, oh, did we offend them? You know, are they, are they ever coming back again? And I don't know how many people that type of neurosis affects, but it's something that you do have to get over. And um, if you see him again, you see him again. If not, hopefully you find out why, but don't dwell on it. Don't let it, don't let it drive you crazy. But because um, lots of times people will come and, and, and um, come late and leave early. And there's really nothing that you can do about that except trying to be accommodating to everybody when they do show up. Okay, let's see here. Oh, jumped a little bit. Doodlulululu. Endgame mentions, my gaming group consists of a lot of my friends. There's always a rift between us when it comes to what games we actually get to play. For example, one person literally has to play Catan or else. Um, that sounds like a fun time. Um, perpetual, perpetual Catan. <laughs> um, the, I will say this, when it comes to a game club, one of the biggest problems that we have every single meeting, even not even the ones I run, but all of them I see, is that first 15 minutes of getting started. Oftentimes, there are difficulties in choosing which game to start with because no one wants to offend anyone else and they want to, you know, don't want to be stepping on anyone's toes. So if your game club can find a fun way to mix up who gets to pick the first game to play, that can go 
that can help prevent the perpetual Catan problem. That can also help uh, everyone feel like they're involved. And if it's something where uh, people kind of either you know, totally random, like it's a game in and of itself, or something where you, you can uh, have it scheduled so people know when their choice for the first game is going to come up, um, it can help them also to feel more engaged, knowing, oh, yeah, yeah next week it's my pick. So it's another thing to do. Um, let's see. Uh, Scott mentions, of course, I'm also limited in my ability to game outside the house, as well as my wife and I have a burgeoning future game group of six kids. Um, yeah, there's, um, I will say that I, I only have one child, but um, even w any amount of children can actually significantly, significantly increase the difficulty on in finding a game club. There's a friendly local game shop in town that uh, runs um, game clubs once or twice a week. And it's like, oh, great, you know, uh, I'll go down there. But um, I have to kind of manage it. Uh, they're in the evenings, which is always difficult because that's kind of family time and stuff. So it's like, oh, well, maybe, you know, if there's other kids, I'll, uh, I'll take my daughter, uh, my nine-year-old daughter down there. So I went to go find out more information about it. And the first thing that the shop owner uh, mentioned was he was really excited about their game clubs because they just got their liquor license and now they can be selling drinks. Like, oh, well, that is cool. but That's not going to be a conducive environment to a nine-year-old, is it? So I was like, well, not going to be able to attend that one. But, you know, that's cool that you're setting it up and you got that worked out and, and that's great. But, yeah, not, not going to be uh, a fit for me. So... That can definitely require extra legwork um, and coordination, um, depending on how kids fit into the game group. Um, uh, Joshua asks, do you have a method for choosing games? Like Eric Summerer of the Dice Tower podcast has a board game choosing game. Um, I know, knowing what, uh, knowing Eric as little as I do, but knowing Eric, I also wouldn't be surprised if Eric circumvents that problem by having a board game, choosing game, choosing game, where he probably has a variety of those and he has a game to choose which game choosing game he chooses for his group. Uh, but that's just because I believe Eric is an evil genius. Um, but for the rest of us who don't have that level of craftiness available to us, um, the answer to your question is, do I have a method for choosing games? No, um, we don't have anything that cool that we do. We, to be honest, we usually end up for first 10 or 15 minutes making small talk going, um, somebody want to play? Who, what do you want to play? I don't know. What do you want to play? And we, we do need to come up with something. When, when we first started the game club and we didn't know each other as well, I had systematic ways we would draw like a deck of cards and whoever got the highest card would pick first or we had a, I had uh, cards named numbered one through 20 and we just you know then the highest card would pick or who traveled the farthest who showed up first as a reward for showing up on time whoever's the newest person there there's lots of really simple ways that you can democratically pick you know uh, who's going to pick the first game or pick the first game but as we've gone grown to know each other a lot better um it's just a lot of it's turned into, hey, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? And and that could be okay. Uh, it just depends on your, your group. Um, okay. We have two minutes left. So let's see here. Oh, Joshua asks, how long is the written policy for your game club? Um, I It's not long. It's like a page or two. And to be honest, a lot of, a lot of the written policy for my game club is actually... I'd say 75% of it is a repurposed um, agreement for an online forum, online community that I managed, because a lot of the same ideas apply. Golden rule, don't be a jerk. And, you know, no hate speech, no, no stuff like that. Be respectful. Common sense respect type stuff is 75% 75, uh, 75 of it was, probably was pulled from that and used. And then the additional... 25% or so is stuff specific to the games. How do we handle drinks? How do you handle snacks? How do we handle this? And, and stuff like that. And probably mine, to be honest, mine probably needs to be updated. Um, but there you go. Um, doesn't have to be super in-depth. And again, too, the written policy, if you, if you set that up for your game club, 
don't think that you have to get 100% of it done right ahead of time. Start with what you know and treat it as a living, evolving document because stuff's going to come up that you never even thought about that you're going to have to address. So don't think you got to get 100% in stone. Have Be flexible with it. Get what you can down and then evolve and update it over time. Speaking of time, we're now out of time. So I apologize for anyone's questions or comments that I did not get to, uh, but I appreciate everyone who has been showing up and involved in our discussions. Um, it's like the highlight of my day. So, um, see, last time I mentioned that I needed to rework my outro, and I did, and I had it written out on a little text document, which I scrolled away from and couldn't find, so now I've ruined the outro again. So, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Metagame, and... Be sure to join us on the Dice Tower and Pair of Dice Paradise's um, YouTube channels, Facebook, and Twitter for more board game news, reviews, commentary, and discussion. Until you do that, I've been Chaz Marler, your host of the Metagame, thanking you all for joining me. Talk to you again really soon. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.